All right, welcome back. Another week of Podding with PT. I'm Patrick. And I'm Tyler. And today we got a special guest on, Dr. Emily Diamato, or Dadamo, Dadamo, apologies. All good. Happens, I mean, since birth. Yeah. <laughs> so Emily is a naturopathic doctor um, right now practicing out of, is it Bridgeport? So I'll be a naturopathic physician in about 12 days, but right now I'm still a student clinician. So I'm practicing out of the University of Bridgeport School of Naturopathic Medicine, where I do see patients on shift there. Gotcha. Okay, so if you don't mind just letting us know first, um, how'd you get into it? I know you come from a a family of doctors, so. Yeah, so I never really thought I was going to be a physician. Um, Just didn't really think it was in the cards for me. It was always kind of just like a not a lazy kid, but like creative, creative, very like just slow moving kid. And I studied philosophy and bioethics in college. So I got really good at arguing and reading things and writing papers. And I kind of gravitated towards advocating for patients. Um, I worked in uh, St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx, if you're familiar, working um, alongside people who were changing the way that Medicaid was distributed to patients. So low income Um, health insurance based services kind of towards less away from being fee for service or paying for what you get and more towards value based for paying for what you receive and how good it is and how good you turn out. Um, So for me, I really loved that I absolutely if I could just keep advocating for patients for the rest of my life, I'd be perfectly happy. But it was an internship and it ended and so I kind of felt myself feeling a little lost and not sure what to do. So I worked in healthcare PR for a long time. And eventually I had this hard sit with myself where I realized I really just wanted to be with patients. I just felt like I finally felt confident enough to do it myself. Um, Then the question became not so much whether or not I do medicine, but what kind of medicine I do. So I was debating between getting a DO or an ND. So a doctoral degree in naturopathic medicine. And it ultimately came down to the fact that my father and his father were both naturopaths. And I had this realization where I was like, you know, that's a cool thing. You should lean into it. Like this is a special branch of medicine and it's a special thing to kind of tap into an ancestral practice like that. So I did it. I moved out of New York, moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut and just started studying. I hit the books real hard. Yeah. So can you touch a little bit upon what what exactly a naturopathic doctor is? Yeah, so we're trained in all things medicine. We have four years of anatomy, physiology, pathology, diagnostics, physical exam, pharmacology, all the things that make someone competent in being a physician. But then on top of it, a naturopathic physician practice what we call as whole body medicine or whole person medicine. So this idea that you are not just one pathology, you are an individual with a disease process. So say you have an autoimmune condition, a naturopath is still gonna work on your gut health, still gonna work on getting you moving in a way that feels right in your body. Obviously they're gonna address your inflammation, your autoimmunity and those things, but really when it boils down to it, they're gonna work with you as a person. So um, yeah, we study things like botanical medicine, a lot of natural phytotherapies. So using plant compounds medicinally, a lot of nutrition and dietotherapy, a ton of nutrition hours, sports medicine, exercise physiology, prescription writing of exercise and movement, and um, some mind-body medicine too, although that's not necessarily my strong suit, but I always work with people on their mind and their mental health. Ah, nice. Um, You talked a little bit about um, just like what you do, and I wanted to know, so what is, and you kind of talked about this on your other podcast, what is wellness to you? Like for us, it's more of, I don't know about you, Pat, but for me, it's as well as you can move and control your own body and control, like say different joints or know your body awareness. So for me, it maybe it doesn't boil it down as much to if you're in pain or not, but more so the the quality of your movement and how how you're understanding your body. So how does that kind of mean for you, the wellness meaning? That vibes with me. I definitely think it's like some people always say, you know, where your baseline is, like finding that baseline and being at your baseline. But I sometimes argue that like your baseline is constantly changing, but health is all about getting to where you can meet yourself wherever you are at that day. 
So, I mean, for someone that has a chronic disease, that baseline is going to just fluctuate on a daily basis, but wellness really is having the toolkit, having the resources to be able to meet yourself where you're at on that day and show up for yourself and feel good. So I'm all about that. I think a major part of wellness is uh, that a major part of wellness is that awareness piece. And like you said, like you're constantly changing, your baseline is constantly changing. It's like, what am I feeling today? What should I work on today? And like, and it's, there's no, I, you reach a end point. I was like, oh, I'm healthy. It's like that constant (laughs) checking in with yourself and then just realizing what you need. Right. hundred percent. Like wellness is never over. It's never achieved. Mm. I have so many patients that are like, oh, you know, I really want to feel the way I felt 10 years ago. And it's like, we'll get you feeling really good. And there's no argument that you can't necessarily feel that way, but also like you're in your body today. How do you feel today? hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, my, one of my questions for you is, so what, what is a, a, a typical eval look like for you? Or what are you going through with like, say you have patient day one and they're coming into you, uh, or I guess what kind of patient population do you see first? Sure. I see a lot of patients from all different kinds of backgrounds. I'm based in Bridgeport. So a lot of people, um, a lot of it is community-based medicine. It's a lot of people who don't have access to medicine in general because it's a non-insurance clinic. But then there are also people who are interested in alternatives to medicine and medical care. Um, so the kind of patient I see varies and ranges, but um, I'd say for the most part, a lot of my, the kind of patient I attract is the person who wants to be a participant in their health. Like I am all about giving you all the information, all of the resources, all of the things you can do so that you can step up and show up for yourself. And that is that's a very specific kind of person. That person wants to learn and that person wants to grow. But I'm also, I find I'm pretty good at inspiring that and someone who doesn't know that's possible in themselves. So yeah, I would say patient demographics, it's everywhere from, you know, a two-year-old to very, very late, late in the game people. But, you know, I love them all. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, so do people come to you or do you kind of market yourself? So put yourself out there. Yeah, so the way it works in a student clinic is someone just signs up and they get who they get. But I've definitely had some word of mouth where it's like someone's really enjoyed working with me and then I'm all of a sudden I'm like treating their entire family. Like that's always what happens is like you treat aunties and uncles and then you just go down the lineage and then you go up the lineage and then you go to the neighbors. So it's all about it's all about if you vibe well with that one patient because that word of mouth is so important. Yeah, until I... The other week, uh, actually in preparation for this uh, podcast, I've never heard of like a naturopathic doctor. <laughs> no, which is kind of interesting because y'all are in California where they're like yeah. so many. <laughs> right. And so it's like how common, is, like I don't know if you have these answers, but how common is that like throughout the country? So it varies. It varies based on state because they're state regulated. So in some states, um, there's no licensure. So someone like me, despite having four years of education and a degree, I can't physically touch a patient. Um, And I mean, people, there also are unlicensed naturopaths who don't follow the same curriculum, but it's just, unfortunately, we share the same name due to some weird legal logistics. So it varies from state to state. I would say they're very much more common on the West Coast, where I think just generally the population is a lot more interested in wellness but east coast naturopathic medicine's been along for quite some time too and it's it's kind of a different vibe there's a little bit of a grittiness to it because our west coast friends can prescribe pharmaceuticals they can hang iv bags they can do injections prolotherapy platelet rich and platelet poor injections and over here i can do everything but prescribe i can't inject i can only puncture skin to diagnose so phlebotomy and those kinds of things so we have to get a little you have to get a little finesse to you you have to learn really how to do what you can with what you've got so i love it here but it's different yeah definitely um so my question yeah so what is patient comes into you what is something that you look for like how do you how do you run your evals for sure. 
I have, I mean, I follow a typical soap note, so subjective objective assessment plan, but I just go really into it. Like, I wanna know your entire health history. I want you to bring in any labs, any imaging you've had. I wanna talk about your surgical history. I wanna talk about your hospitalization history. I also wanna talk about your diet. What do you eat in a day? How does it make you feel when you eat? What does your poop look like? Like, how does your stomach feel on a daily basis? When you exercise, if you do exercise, how do you feel? Is there pain? Is there post-exertional fatigue or anything out of the ordinary for you? Family history is huge. So I go down the list of like grandparents, aunts, uncles, kids, how everyone's doing, kind of familial tendencies, whether or not we should be considering cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmunity, metabolic diseases. And then on top of it, I kind of check in on like what, what your goals are. So where you're at in your journey. So are you ready to go every step of the way? Or are you kind of having a hard time figuring out where you can show up for yourself? Cause that's getting that in and knowing where you're going to relate to the patient is going to change the entire plan of action because some people it's baby steps and handholding and other people it's just pages of extensive information and, a you know, you've got this pat on the back. So the intake is extensive. It's definitely extensive, but I, the more data, the better it is. So. And you touched on a pretty, pretty big thing or one that I'm really questioning. I never knew how important like your poop was like, so like oh. uh, I had taken this cleanse not too long ago and it, it dealt with a little bit like that leaky gut syndrome which I kind of know, but not really, really much about if you can go into that. But the, the change I felt afterwards, like I felt less like bloated. I just felt like my, my mental clarity was a bit better. So if you can kind of go into like what that leaky gut syndrome is, because I, I would, would like to know a little more about that one. And that's, it's, that's one of my favorite areas to talk about is like gut health, the microbiome. So like we basically share our bodies with thousands and thousands of organisms that live in our digestive tract and they like participate in our metabolism, our digestion, our inflammatory signaling. They, everything about our microbiome contributes to our health. So, um, your poop is like a gateway into not just like how your stomach feels, but how your metabolism's going. So um, leaky gut is kind of a casual term for something called intestinal permeability, which is when the lining of your gut cells kind of separate ever so slightly. And this becomes problematic because it lets the kind of dirty intestinal content. So like your poop, your bacteria, foodborne antigens, all of these things, it lets them interface with your immune system. So you, it's a, it can be a hot mess, honestly, because your immune system, a huge amount of it's in your gut and it really shouldn't be interacting with bacteria. It shouldn't be interacting with food antigens. It shouldn't be interacting with things in your gut. So that's gonna cause inflammation. A lot of people report like early morning stiff joints, brain fog, overall fatigue, sluggishness, like these kind of broad spectrum symptoms of inflammation. And a lot of the times it comes back to that gut lining being disturbed. So how does that, yeah, how does that riff happen? Oh yeah, love that. It's an interesting one. A lot of, um, a lot of the research right now is in a particular bug called Colincella. And Colin cella really shouldn't be in your gut at all, but it is in a lot of people. It's actually found very commonly in like hyper-processed pasteurized milk. And what it does is like the two cells of your gut are held together by like a little button. And this button is called zonulin and Colin cella eats that button. So eats that zonulin button as a meal. So it just basically says, I'm going to take this little adhesion away from you. And then I'm going to slowly allow for these cells to separate. So when I do like a microbiome analysis in someone who has leaky gut, I oftentimes see really high levels of colincella. Um, is, when someone signs up to come see you, it's like, mm -hmm. do you give them, hey, I want you to do these things? Like, I want you to get these labs or I'm a, before you come in? So, um, Usually, no. Most of the times the way it works in a student clinic is just I get what I get. Like I get someone and they're like, hey, you know, I feel this way. And then my, my mind says, okay, two things. 
what do I need to rule out? Is there anything serious today that needs to be ruled out? And then where, what precisely would be the best way to figure out the kind of underpinnings of what's going on? So if there's something that looks like it's maybe an inflammatory condition in the bowel, you need to still rule out those kind of big bad pathologies. But after kind of hearing someone's story, I might say, okay, go, take a poop next morning, swipe it with a Q-tip, Q -tip, send it to a lab and send me the raw data so I can go and look at the actual relative abundances of your gut bacteria. Some people, they poop just fine, so why spend money? And they may find that they're better suited for either a genomic analysis or just some regular blood work to see if they're iron deficient or something like that. Oh, you went in and answered my next question because I was like, you look, you're talking about these things that seem really in depth. <laughs> so it's like, wow. I was like, I don't know. The thing about, like <laughs> even listening to you were on uh, what is wellness podcast and mm -hmm. you were talking about blood types and what they may mean for your nutrition. I was like, I don't know what my blood type is. <laughs> and so I was like, I, I, that is right. That is right. There is definitely, that's something that's a non-negotiable for me, I would say like, and it's, um, you can get it done at Quest if someone orders it for you at Quest or LabCorp, or you can get a little kit and just blood type. So I'll actually blood type all patients in office, but um, that's totally a non-negotiable for me. That's a good one. And so just thinking about this level of like information that you should know about your body. I, also these I don't like, know, no. like your blood pressure, <laughs> your, your resting heart rate and things like that is like, I typically don't think about where you're constantly thinking of everything, taking all of this information. For sure. For sure. And I definitely think algorithmically, like, I mean, it's interesting. I used to think this was kind of a curse where it's like my mind just goes a billion places at once. But when it comes to medicine, like it's good to have a number of competing thoughts at once. So you can kind of think or like, what's the big bad stuff I need to rule out. All right. That's ruled out. Like, where is this patient in this arena of health? Where are they going here? What's, what's their blood pressure? What's their heart rate? So um, yeah, there's definitely always you're always assessing, you're always using all of your senses, even small things like, what do they smell like? Do they, you know, like, what am I seeing? What am I, what am I feeling when I'm doing my physical exam? Like all the senses are kind of constantly firing. Can you go a little bit into that, that blood type and what that does with nutrition or how you look at it? Yeah, like, yeah I have no clue what my blood type okay. is. So I should probably get that checked. So one of my favorite topics for sure, but, um, so your blood type is decided by like a little sugar on your red blood cells. And um, I'm an A, so I have one type of sugar. A B has a different type of sugar. A, Bs actually have both of those and Os have none. And um, people kind of think of blood type as just being something that's relevant to like whether or not you're going to reject a transfusion. Yep. But um, there's a huge amount of literature on the interaction that your blood type antigen has with a lot of different food-based molecules, as well as like uh, pathogens. So for example, um, I'm an A and uh, let's see. So let me back it up actually a little bit. The food-based molecules that I'm talking about are something called lectins, which are little uh, protein binding carbohydrate molecules that plants have to defend themselves. And they're really, really specific. So they don't just bind any protein, they bind a protein that they want to bind. So if your red blood cell antigen is lucky enough to be the perfect match for that lectin, then there's going to be kind of an agglutination reaction where that plant-based lectin is going to bind your red blood cell antigen in the gut. And it's going to cause a kind of inflammatory and also it's going to hinder your ability to absorb nutrients in the gut. And so nutritional recommendations based on blood type when considering lectins are basically avoiding lectins that are known to agglutinate your red blood cell. So for example, the way that we actually test, like if Pat was gonna send his blood to Quest and we were gonna test it to see what um, blood type he is, Quest would apply Pat's blood to a number of different 
lectins known to agglutinate each blood type. And um, if Pat were a blood type A, he would agglutinate the lectin that's found in Lyme amines. That's still to this day what they use. So Pat really shouldn't be eating Lyme beans if he's a blood type A. Ah, uh, I'm afraid to take something. Uh, <laughs> That's like, I got to cut up my favorite food. It makes me more like curious <laughs> or just like, even being like coming back to that awareness piece. It's like, all right, I know I shouldn't eat this or <laughs> overindulge. I, yeah. I don't want to say I like be restrictive of what yeah. I diet, but just being aware of what foods uh, interact with my body and how I should feel afterwards. And <laughs> totally. And that's, I mean, that's really the, the goal. I think my goal particularly is I'm just not a fan of restriction at all. It just lends itself to really poor outcomes. There's a lot of shame and reject in restriction a lot of the time for people. So for me, I'm all like, this just gives you more context. And I always say, you know, People say you should follow a diet about 80, 20% of the time. Really statistically, whether or not you follow it 100% doesn't make a difference. If you just follow it 80% of the time, it becomes a lifestyle and not this like thing that you need to kind of force yourself into. So that's always been what I stress first and foremost is like restriction is not welcome in my presence. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Okay. I, I think it's similar with, um physical therapy and just physical activity is like I don't ever want to like this is what you need to do uh it's like you have to do this it's like do what feels right for your body um coming back to mindset because we get into this state of I have to do everything perfectly with right loading like if I getting under a squat bar or doing playing some type of sport I have to do it perfectly or I'm gonna hurt myself and it's like it will take a step back that stress, that worry, that anxiety of not performing the perfect motion takes away of movement is the medicine. And so. hundred oh, oh, <laughs> percent mic drop. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the questions. So for us, uh, I've been seeing a lot of stuff about like the brain drive neurotrophic feature or was it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so kind of what you were talking about, like the movement is medicine. So uh, if you can kind of touch on your field and how that works, because for us, the BDNF yeah. obviously improves the mood and everything, but then you can get a lot, a lot deeper into that, I feel like. Yeah, I, I love being at BDNF because I think it's, it's a really good way to reframe exercise as something that's good for your brain versus good for your body. I think a lot of people always exercise to change their shape. And it's like, if you can exercise to change your state, that's a lot more lasting. So BDNF is something called a myokine. So it's released under um, physical exertion, right? And it actually stimulates both the production of new neurons and the connections between existing ones. So BDNF is just about the most interesting things as far as like the rewards we get from exercise. There was this really awesome study. I think it was published in Nature a while back where basically they took two groups of mice. They had sedentary mice that didn't move and then runner mice that did that, that exercise and ran. And what they did is they extracted serum from both groups and injected it into a group of sedentary mice. So sedentary mice either got runner plasma or sedentary plasma. And they found that those sedentary mice, when they received the infusions from runner mice, had better hippocampal volume, they had better memory, they exhibited better understanding of the tasks, they navigated, I think, a pretty extensive maze better, which is like, you know, it's fascinating because I think they didn't even need to move to get the benefits of exercise because it was just simply the molecules released from another mouse's work. Of course, like, I don't think we should say Tyler <laughs> is serum and inject someone who's sedentary and to get mm. that benefit. But like, it really does drive home the point that exercise is medicine. Yeah, uh, that was one of the ones that that same study it was like where they took the mice that didn't move and they took a mice and put them on the, the hamster wheel. It was crazy mm -hmm. just to see how much better they did through the maze, like you were saying. So yeah. even taking that like with our patients and saying, okay, like you don't have to be specific with everything, just move. 
And like, it's pretty crazy when you like think about the, the level of like Alzheimer's and how that kind of is at this point, like almost not guaranteed, I want to say, but yeah. some form of dementia is, is more so very common for people. And the way in which I think with COVID, a lot of people didn't do much and the, th and the gym was their therapy from that BDNF release. So like, I don't know how that's going to now play in into the future of like maybe earlier onset because we didn't have that or. Right. I sure hope not because I think I've, there's a statistic that's like when you hit the age of 85, you have about a 50% chance of developing Alzheimer's, which is, that's a, that's a really big, that's a big chance. And again, those kind of basics, I think, I mean, especially considering the pandemic, those basics were lost because understandably we're all under so much stress and the world as we knew it just drastically changed. So we lost those kind of mainstays. We lost access to really nutri nutrient rich food. We lost access to movement at the gym. We lost exercise classes. We lost community, social bonding. Like we really, I think, um, took a big hit as far as like our preventive measures go for our health during COVID. Yeah, I think that was a, a huge thing. And then you talked about also just like the neurogenesis portion. First mm -hmm. off, can you answer any questions on mushrooms? We, we had a, a talk on this earlier today. Any questions? So do you have any or just mushrooms in general? Oh, well, because I was, uh, we were at a juice spot and we were just talking about I'm seeing the push for um, supplements with that contain mushrooms mm -hmm. um, and it's just like what exactly is the benefits because like I it's hard for anything that's posted on Instagram I always like take it with like or any social yeah. media I'm just like why are you trying to push this on me <laughs> yeah that's so true I um I love mushrooms I really do and I think social media is a tough one to engender trust in certain things, which is side note. I think like if someone is recommending something or if they're sharing a study, they should always cite it on social media. Like that should be, I mean, that should be required, but mushrooms are awesome. I mean, like on the most basic level, they're extremely nutrient dense for calorically a very little cost. They have um, prebiotics, so they feed the good gut bacteria with their chitin. They also have something called beta glucan in it, which is not only good for, again, a source of fiber and prebiotic, but it's also what we call an immune modulator. So um, they found that beta glucan from mushrooms can actually recruit natural killer cells, which are like our first line defense to help us fight infection, to help us clear out foreign antigens. Um, so mushrooms during cold and flu season, really good for you. And then, I mean, you get into the specifics of each individual mushroom and that's where things get kind of nuanced, but also exciting. So on the topic of BDNF is lion's mane mushroom, which is that like kind of hairy looking one. Um, lion's mane has been found to stimulate nerve growth factor, which is similar to BDNF in that it stimulates nerve neurogenesis, but also that connections between brain cells. So lion's mane is being touted as something called a nootropic, which is like a brain growing agent. So you've probably heard about like nootropic people just like taking a bunch of supplements for their brain health and things like that. Lion's mane, even dietarily. So like buying one at your farmer's market, cooking it up in some ghee or butter, whatever you like is like really nutritive for your brain. Yeah, I have a, so what I, I didn't buy the, um, the kind of supplements at the store this morning because I was like I want to be intentional with as like I, I see on the bottle is like it has all these effects yeah. and I was just like but what does that mean for me and <laughs> I was like I was like oh the all these things like oh um less brain fog and you know nutrients yeah. I was like oh these all are good but it's like I don't know what I need and I want to take time to sit with myself and uh, make sure I am putting things in my body that I know what um, I can see the greatest impact. Yeah. And that's where, um, so my kind of niche or like what my specialty is, is in something called precision medicine, which is just like removing the guessing game from supplements and nutritional interventions entirely by using analytics. So genomics, microbiome data, 
to make informed recommendations. So lion's mane is going to do better in one person than another. Not that it would cause side effects, but they might actually really feel a benefit from it in so many more ways because of the ways that their genes express themselves. Um, if we kind of think about, um, I'll use lion's mane as an example, or kind of scaling back, I'll go back to the BDNF, which is that some people have um, polymorphisms or changes in the actual gene that encodes the protein BDNF. And it actually, oddly enough, predisposes them to the cycle of binging and restricting. And um, lion's mane is something that modulates BDNF as well as um, brain growth factor or nerve growth factor. So, you know, you can start to get a little more specific about the recommendations you wake, make. So all of a sudden I'm not saying, Pat, you should take lion's mane so that you can think better. I'm saying, Pat, you have a SNP in BDNF. SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, which means that you at baseline underexpress this gene, which makes it harder for you to synthesize BDNF. And lion's mane is actually gonna boost that production. So um, I always say as much as I love knowing a lot of things, it'd be better to know the person, to know yourself, and then make those recommendations really precise. Oh, interesting. Um, well, and then you spoke on the, the nootropics. So we've taken, um, have you heard of Qualia? Oh, yeah. There's so much stuff in that. There, there's a lot. Um, I, I personally have felt a difference with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought they were pretty good. Do you have any other like ones that you take or ones that you recommend? Yeah. So again, it always differs. Um, let's see, I'll use myself as an example. Um, so I have a SNP or a mutation in a gene called PEMT, which stands for phosphatidylethanolamine methyltransferase, super long-winded, but basically what it does is it takes one phospholipid on your cell membrane and makes it into the other kind. You have four total options for phospholipids on your cell membrane, and they have the ability to switch between one another when you need them. Um, that synthesis is super important, not only for like maintenance of your cell membrane and keeping it nice and fluid so that things can kind of work really healthfully in the cell, but it's also, they act as cell messengers. So in like inflammation or something like that, like your phospholipids might clip off and go inside the cell to signal a response. Um, interestingly enough, the SNP that I have makes it really difficult for me to make that transfer. And women, as they go through the lifespan, it gets even more difficult to make that transfer if they have the variant because um, estrogen is also something that modulates this SNP. So going down my lifespan, eventually I will be menopausal and I'm gonna have a difficult time activating this enzyme that helps my cell membrane stay nice and fluid. Um, choline, dietary choline is a really good way to modulate this. It's also a nootropic if it comes in the city choline form, but most choline will do because choline also is involved in the creation of acetylcholine. If you guys know that, cause it's also a neuromuscular stimulant. Um, acetylcholine is super necessary for cognition, memory, retention, all these things. So what I do is I take city choline and that modulates my PEMT enzyme. It also helps me maintain my choline stores so that I get adequate acetylcholine for my focus. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Um, another thing you talked about was like the, the efficiency of the things that you put in your body versus, versus things that you may not need. Uh, I saw or listened to a podcast that was like, I think we're overusing probiotics. Mm -hmm. Not everyone actually needs probiotics. Like, what is your, your take on that? For sure. I mean, like, I have, I'm just thinking about it. I've noticed this recently. I have so many patients. I'm sure if you guys have like ever bought a probiotic bottle before you've looked on the back and it's probably said lactobacillus. Like that's always the number one thing. Okay. That's the bug. That's the bug of choice. I have so many patients that have like a metric ton of lactobacillus and then like they have really low levels of all the other good bugs. So yeah, I think probiotics are often overused because it's just like not, again, it's not very intelligent to just like bomb your system with one thing without knowing what you need. And then there's a very high likelihood that that one thing is going to outcompete something that's also very good for you. 
So food is honestly a really good way to get a nice, robust microbiome. I always go the food route if I can. Um, how would, so this got my, my wheels turning of like, wow, I should be more intentional with what I eat, what I do. So what would you recommend would be like the first steps in order to do that? For sure. Um, well, it seems like you've got the mindset. So that's always my first step, but it sounds like the mindset's down pat, pun intended. So, uh -huh. <laughs> um, so next I would say, like, I always go the, if you're just looking for like the way to be your best self, I go the genomics and the microbiome route. So looking at your genes and seeing like, where can we be actionable? Because that is like the best way we talked earlier about like the importance of a good family history when you're being a physician. That's a really good way for us to be intentional and say, okay, you have a history of cardiovascular disease or you have a history of X, Y, and Z in your family. Your genes show that you have this issue with cholesterol metabolism, or you have this variant in one of the lipid markers. Like let's be intentional and actually start to work on that. And let's change your diet in this route. And then your microbiome too is another way. Like, do you have leaky gut? That's going to expose your system to a lot more inflammation. So if you're taking a probiotic or if you're taking a nootropic for brain fog, but you've got inflammation going on, you're going to stay with that brain fog and you're just going to take an extra supplement. Mm. So that's usually the first step I would say. And so is there any like, at home access to, or, um, to those being able to take those genome tests, send it mm -hmm. in somewhere there's their access to that. Yeah. So if you work with a clinician like me, what I do is I have my patients, I'll usually have them do 23 in me, but ancestry also same thing. Just a couple of the things that I like to look at aren't included, but you can spit in a tube, send it to 23 and me, and they'll send it back to you. And then actually on the homepage for your account, there's an option to download your raw data. And just quick side note, um, I think a lot of people are a little skeptical about sequencing their genome because of whether or not that information is going to be used for something else. I always tell my patients, you have the option to opt out of your genes being used for anything other than your own information. They can stay solely with you and then it becomes um, your safe. So that's an aside, but what I do is I then run the raw data through a program that has like tons and tons of algorithms that have researched both like PubMed data is constantly funneling into it, but it has all of the outlined different pathways, metabolic pathways that we use in the body, but then also like methylation, inflammation, neuroendocrine, all these different kind of axes in the body. So then what I do with the patient is say, Pat, if you were my, pa my patient, I would sit down with you and I would just go through everything. And say, if you had a chief complaint of leaky gut or, you know, headaches, we would kind of hyper-focus on certain areas, but we'd give you the whole picture so that you would leave that appointment with not only personalized recommendations, but some dietary recommendations for you. Um, people can, if they don't wanna work with a clinician, I wouldn't recommend it because it's pretty complicated, but you're more than welcome to. There are some at-home tests. I think Self-Hacked has a gene test. I think, um, I think it's called Stratagene also has it. You don't get the full breadth of information, um, and then you also don't get a physician to kind of walk you through it, but they're, they're available. Certainly. Yeah. I think I definitely need to do that. <laughs> Cause I was sitting there listening to the whole thing. I was like, I eat the same thing every day and I really don't know if it's as, as healthy as it should be now. Honestly, it's a process. And like just waking up in the morning is a miracle. Honestly. So. Right. Right. Um, I was just thinking like, eat the rainbow uh oh, <laughs> just like <laughs> okay. uh, with the different foods and everything. 
I, like not some Skittles commercial. Yeah, like, like, Skittle <laughs> just eat the rainbow. <laughs> no, but like different colored foods, uh, yeah, yeah, adding yeah. some variety into the diet. So just for sure, variety out. is like a really good way to keep your gut bacteria on their toes. Mm. So, like, I mean, you can kind of equate it. Like, if you eat the same thing every day, you're just gonna feed the bugs that like that one food. And then say you have like a really important bacterial species that doesn't eat that, that's going to struggle to get the energy source it needs. Oh, so okay. yeah, variety is the spice of life. Ah, oh, but the convenience factor, I'm like, damn. I know, so I know. <laughs> Meal prepping when you're like a professional is it's such a lifesaver. Yeah, so I definitely need to get into that more. Um, one of the other things that I had like a question on, so one big thing that we would talk about in, in my clinic or that I would talk to with my patients is like, it's very interesting when COVID first started that we washed absolutely everything. It was like, you got a package, you sprayed it down. You did yeah. anything that you touched. Um, and so for at the time, it's like, all right, let's see if we can try to control COVID. But the other part of that I wondered was like, all right, that's a lot of bacteria that we were used to touching and used to like strengthening our immune right. system. And I felt like, so I got, I must've been like the common cold this year. And I hadn't been sick in years. Um, and it, it was pretty, I was like for a week and a half, I was like, my immune system has never been that challenged. No. I felt like with the common cold. So I was like, what did, what did your take on, on how we, did we over, like over sanitize everything? Honestly, I'm like super forgiving of our early COVID selves because we just didn't know any better. So I don't know if we overdid it. I'm glad we're not still doing it because it was like, it was a very stressful time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think about like people using their bare hands and like getting gas with a Clorox wipe. And I'm like, that's also not. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very forgiving of our early COVID practices, but I also have noticed, yeah, definitely in the past year, people are getting kind of rocked by the common cold. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. Like, I think on the one hand, we did see just how much masking and hygiene did kind of protect us, the fortunate and the blessed. Like I worked in a clinic and I masked every single day. And I mean, I, I did get COVID once, but for the most part, it was always very, very clean. Um, but I think it's just going to be kind of a natural coming back to living in an environment that we share with viruses, living in an environment that we share with bacteria and being mindful of that. Um, and also of our friends who are not able to mount robust immune responses, whether it's a, an issue that they've had their life or they're on medications that don't allow them to, it's, it'll always be a delicate game of being responsible. Yeah, because even like going to the gym, like I would wash my hands after, but I felt like just every time I touched a machine, I was like, let me wash this down yeah, before, yeah. before I use it. And then it one, it just takes so much time, every single thing. And the hand sanitizer bottle is pretty gross because everybody's okay. touching that <laughs> to spray the thing. Right. So I'm like, yeah, I don't I even want to touch that. this. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like I think about um, just the sheer amount of hand sanitizer we've used and and the you know, the skin microbiome is really important too. Um, you guys are going to be so sick of me talking about the microbiome, but it's oh, like, we no, I love it. We share so much of our physical bodies with these bacteria. Our skin microbiome is so good. You know, we, we really need that. I mean, we have bugs that oxidize ammonia, for example, and they are really helpful for maintaining a really good skin barrier. So when we're constantly just killing them, we become very susceptible to like basic things like irritant contact dermatitis, rashes, um, fungal infections, because again, we share our skin with fungus and all of a sudden the things that would normally keep them at bay are gone. So they're going to have a heyday. Like it's an interesting, again, it all comes back to that balance. Yeah. The skin is the, what the first layer of defense. hundred percent. It really is. Gee. Yeah. Cause I, that yeah that cold I felt like for me I know you got a little actually sick you might have had COVID but the cold yeah. for me was like I usually be like two days and then I'd be fine but this one was like a week and a half and I noticed you is that your aura ring that you have 
Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> I, <laughs> I had one, but RIP, I lost that LAX Air Force. Oh, that's a tough thing it to lose. Tough. But even just watching like the metrics on that stuff, like for days, my sleep was messed up. It was like my REM sleep had gone down. My recovery was as yeah. for like probably about a week. So, but yeah, my, my, or a tangent on my aura ring, I, I stopped wearing it because I, I think I have sleep apnea. I, mm -hmm. I have never been able to have a good night's sleep. <laughs> And so I stopped wearing my aura ring because it's just like, oh, you have terrible sleep. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, pay, I pay like $300 for you to just uh, to keep telling you that. <laughs> I tell patients this all the time. They're like, what wearable tech device should I get? And I'm like, you got to think long and hard if this is something you want. Because we lived generations without having these things. And we did fine. But now it's like we have all this information on ourselves every single moment of the day is that going to be is that going to take you away from your experiences as a human being outside of your health probably mm -hmm. for some people who are more sensitive i definitely would not recommend it yeah it's hard when you're like trying to look at all these different things so it's like okay my mental health how do how am i with my mental health how's my sleep how's my exercise do i track my exercise what is my blood type how am i moving <laughs> like there's so much to even think about or to even like yeah be aware of or even with like the whoop, it tells you like you should maybe taper off today mm -hmm. because you didn't have a good night of sleep or recovery. But if you're feeling good, yeah, like go, there's that mismatch. That's right. true. So you also have to like check in with yourself to see, all right, how are you feeling? Which yeah, a lot of people get lost in the sauce. There's just Honestly, there's yeah. so much information <laughs> going on. There's like constantly being been bombarded with all this information of what do we need yeah. to do. What's the best? So I was like, That's like, I, I, I sound like a broken record, I'm sure. But I say this all the time. It's like when you're, when you're working on your health or when even just you're being mindful of your health, it's like, you really don't need to shoulder that responsibility all on your own. Like go to physical therapy, have someone responsible for the way you function as a physical moving being, like have someone guide you. Don't just try to decode nutrition for yourself because you'll just go from diet to diet to diet. Have someone working with you so you don't need to, don't stress yourself. Like collaborative care outcomes are astronomically better than just having one person that you see once a year. And it's a lot less stress on the individual. And then all of a sudden it's a lot less pressure on yourself to hit these benchmarks that are arbitrary. Yeah, I think you touched on a huge thing earlier. First off, just like the awareness, like what is what is wellness is like, all right, how are you aware with your body? So like the right. numbers may say this, but okay, I'm I'm in tune enough to know this is what I feel. And like when I'm feeling good and I can lift heavy, say, it's like, I know how that feels. And when I feel like I need to taper off, but also, yeah, I think that's pretty huge. And just going into the, the wellness of you're constantly changing. So yeah. Like you'll never be at, all right, I'm healthy. I had 90% recovery, that means I can do this, this, and this. It's like, hey, on this day, I know I may need to taper down a little bit because of how I know I feel. Right. I think it's all about, we talked about it in the beginning, but like knowing a baseline is good, but like just take it day by day. Take everything in your life day by day. If you don't feel good that day, lean into it. Rest is immensely productive if you let it. Yeah. And also thinking of self-reflecting of after a week or even after a day, then after a week and after a month, it's like, are these things aligning of where you want to be or right. trying to go? Yeah, that is huge. Like I've been telling my patients a lot more recently, like, hey, keep a journal. It was like, don't tell me three weeks from now, your pain is exactly the same. I want you to tell me specifics. Like, okay, did it start? It was 10 minutes of your back hurt when you first came in and now it's 30 minutes. I was like, those are different things that, Hey, that's not body awareness. That's the yeah. responsibility. So I was like, I know if you come in like three weeks later and tell me your pain is exactly the same. And I ask if you have a journal the same day, like, yeah, I guarantee you most people don't, but right. that's one of the things I'm like, Hey, journal, write your stuff down. So that way you can tell yourself like, all right, I still have this pain, but I'm seeing progress in something. That's so true. And it's such a good way to validate yourself too, is like, I think when it comes to pain, because pain is literally and figuratively so sensitive, but like it, it it's really easy, as Pat said, to get kind of like lost in the sauce with pain, like to notice a small improvement 
can sometimes be really hard for people because pain is still painful, but to have like actual data evidence in the form of something you yourself wrote is so validating. I can't, I can't even begin to explain it. So that's awesome here for that. Uh, another question I have for you, do you get people that come in with pain, especially with like um, the way like low back pain may be coming from like gut health or things like that? Yeah, I do. And I will always assess where I can be helpful and then where I can loop in my friends in other professions. So you guys know there's like point location pain and then there's referred pain, right? So if someone's having shoulder pain and they're, you know, a 45 year old woman, and it hurts after they eat. I'm like, okay, I don't think you should need to go to physical therapy. We should probably get, we should get an ultrasound. But yeah, I had people, pain is, um, pain is a great unifier, honestly. So many people experience pain and it's surprisingly hard to, I think for a lot of people describe it because it's just what you exist with sometimes. Um, but I get a lot of people with pain and I think my biggest responsibility for that is, is aiming to land in a space where I can be actionable, um, you know, by way of getting a good diagnosis, getting a good physical exam, and then if need be getting a really good referral and being helpful there, like finding out that root pain cause is so important. Yeah, hundred percent. And another thing that's pretty crazy is like, I don't think I noticed this until I became a PT. Like you said, that pain is just something that people live with. I'm like, how many people have been in pain? Well, I'll have them at the age of 50. Like, oh yeah, this started in high school. I'm like in high school, this yeah. started. I'm like, you just live with this pain. Yeah. I really think people who struggle with pain regularly are superheroes because I mean, pain Pain signals to the brain and tells you to feel like crappy, like mood wise. It makes you angry. It makes you kind of desensitized to other things. It can be like so distracting and people who live with chronic pain get through that like every single day. And I'm always just in awe of the capacity to live with pain in, in so many people. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy even talking about just like the subject of pain. Are you familiar with Laura Mir Mosley? I don't think so. He's a, a pain scientist specialist. I think it's out like Australia or New Zealand. So he tells a story about how he was walking through the bushes. Um, and I think he like brushed up against a, what he thought was a bush and had no pain at all. And then it was a snake bite that ended up being very like venomous to the point where he had to go to the hospital. And mm -hmm. then it was like, he recovered, everything was fine. And then like a year later, he walked past what was actually a, uh, a bush and was like the most agonizing pain he's ever had because he thought it was a snake bite wow. and it was like going back to that. So it was like showing like how the mind plays tricks on people. And it was like, he did the same exact thing before, had no pain. So it was like, for me, that's why I'm like, always like, I get you're in pain and I understand that, but that's not the biggest tell. Like that doesn't yeah. help me that much. Yeah, it's totally. like you have to go deeper mm -hmm. and like, yeah. uh, and to, cause it's also a whole body and mental response. For sure. And there too, that's, I think, another place where epigenetic work can be very helpful because there are certain genes that help us degrade pain signaling molecules. And some people are naturally much slower at doing that. So some people, and they call it um, functional somatic syndromes, but uh, things like fibromyalgia or just kind of like idiopathic pain syndromes that we really don't quite have a good understanding of. Like a lot of the working understanding is that these people have a slow, slower ability to degrade pain signaling molecules. So while there might not be, there might be a ton of trigger points, but there might not be any like exact cause we can pinpoint. It might be something that is very subtly genetically informed. Um, so it's interesting. I think the, I think pain is going to be I think we're going to learn a lot about pain in the next couple of decades for sure. Yeah. You talked about um, just going into things like fibromyalgia. Can you speak on that in yours? Because for us, yeah. it kind of seemed like fibromyalgia and complex regional pain syndrome, that those were just like, hey, we don't know what else to, to say with yeah. this. You have a lot of pain, just, just slap a label on it. So fibro and complex regional pain, I'm less able to speak on complex regional pain. All I understand is it's usually after a trauma 
and kind of like the autonomic nervous system gets disrupted and all of a sudden it's excruciating pain feel for you that sounds so unbearable oh, yeah. um and but fibro is is again linked to that functional somatic syndrome risk um I do, I have a lot of fibro patients and I find that um, definitely working on the epigenetics of these people is very helpful because again, even if they don't have variants in the genes that clear out those pain signaling molecules, supporting those enzymes and making sure they're always running with like nutritional cofactors and things like that. Cause I mean, enzymes don't work on their own. Um, one I'm thinking of is something called COMT, catecholomethyltransferase. It's uh, an enzyme that helps you degrade things like catecholamines, so your stress hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine. But then it also helps you clear out estrogens and those pain signaling molecules. So your COMT speed is going to predict how well you get rid of adrenaline, so how well you can ex you know, show yourself that you're resilient against a stressor but also you're going to experience potentially a difficult time clearing out those pain molecules. So even if someone doesn't have a variant in COMT that would predispose them to like one of these somatic syndromes, that enzyme still should be supported in an attempt to kind of like help the body clear out that excess pain. So one of the best things for fibro and for people with those kind of somatic syndromes is magnesium. COMT loves magnesium. Oh uh, yeah. Can you, can you go further onto that? By the way, Emily's Instagram is, is, is top notch. She always Thank goes you. in and, and does like some type of topic and then explains it in various slides on what it means. But yeah, can yeah. you go into magnesium and like the importance of that on the body? For sure. So thank you. That was really kind. Um, one brief side note that I always like to include about my Instagram is that every single post I do is handwritten, hand created, hand designed, referenced, and, you know, worth a read. It, I think like always ask questions if you don't understand things, but like, I just think people deserve information. Yeah, drop drop the at name. What's the at? Doctor Doctor. So Dr. Dot Emily Dadamo okay. on Instagram. Um, magnesium. Magnesium kicks butt. Um, it's involved in like five hundred enzymes in the body, right? So magnesium is just ubiquitous, but at the same time, we're often depleted. One because the greatest sources of magnesium are things like spinach and um, pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, like these really robustly nutritional foods that people often miss out on. Oh yeah, I'm in there with the dark chocolate. <laughs> hey, I'm in there. <laughs> Let me give you an example right now. So, <laughs> so um, one of the interesting things that I, I really kind of preach is that there's something called a vicious cycle between stress and magnesium. So stress, on the body depletes magnesium because it requires enzymes to clear out stress hormones that require magnesium. Consequently, and also on the other hand, magnesium deficiency predisposes an individual to stress. You are far less resilient against stress when you're magnesium deficient. And symptoms of stress and magnesium deficiency are seriously overlapping. It's fatigue, irritability, pain, um, you know, hypersomnia, so sleeping too much. And um, so uh, magnesium is like one of the best things to have in your corner always, because I don't know anyone that's not stressed. But, you know, kind of tying in that fibromyalgia, the functional somatic syndrome thing is that COMT enzyme that you use to clear out those stress hormones is the same one you use to clear out those pain signaling molecules. So having a well-functioning COMT, which requires magnesium, is going to make you more resilient against stress, but it's also going to relieve your pain. Um, and what's interesting about magnesium is, I mean, dietary magnesium versus what you supplement. Magnesium supplemented comes in the form of a chelate. So they take a magnesium and they actually bind it to something else to make it go to where they need it to go. 
Um, <clears throat> there are a number of forms of magnesium chelates. So there's magnesium citrate oxide, magnesium glycinate, magnesium malate, and they all kind of have different tissue specificity and activities. So I always say like, if pain is your motivator for taking magnesium, magnesium malate is usually the way to go, which is tied to malic acid, which is part of, um, ATP generation in muscle tissue. Oh, okay. Um, what's, so what's the link between, uh, magnesium and is there like more tie into vitamin D? So vitamin D and magnesium have an interesting role. I can't speak on whether or not there's like an exact link. Vitamin D is notorious for being low in so many people, but that's also a really interesting one. Um, because I mean, like on the one hand, vitamin D is important. It's kind of more a hormone than it is a vitamin or nutrient. So it actually signals, um, to your immune system to go from being like the hyper-inflammatory immune type of cell towards an anti-inflammatory and resolving cell. Um, but then it also works in, um, your stress hormone and your catecholamine pro uh, processes. So vitamin D, like when people go outside and feel happy and they always talk about like, I got my vitamin D in, it helps you make serotonin by working on tryptophan hydroxylase. So you are literally like happier with vitamin D. Mm. And then downstream, there's also like from serotonin, you have to make melatonin. So melatonin is also profoundly anti-inflammatory. It also helps you sleep. So there is that tie-in of, you know, inflammatory pain, happiness, vitamin D signaling that I think um, is lost on a lot of people when we spend all our days inside. Yeah, especially coming from the East Coast, like, and I, I try to really tell people out here, they like jokingly say like the seasonal depression. I was like, no, that's real. Like we don't go outside for however, what, three, four months out of the year. It's like, that's so much sun that you're missing out on. And it's like, Although maybe like kind of jokingly is like, that's actually, you're very deficient in, in those things like vitamin D. So like, that's why people are like more touchy. I feel like in the, in the winter time. Right. It's true. I think like, I don't know. It's such a shame that this is what we have to deal with, but I mean, it is like the benefit and the blessing of having shelter when it's cold out, I guess. But like, yeah, winter times, your vitamin D really should be about like 60 to 80 on a lab test. And I see people and they've got a vitamin D of like 20. And it's like, damn, that, that must be tough. That must be tough for your immune system, for like your mental health. Yeah, so that's definitely, that's an easily actionable thing that I think a lot of people are missing out on. Yeah, hundred percent. And like out here, you can tell the difference. It was like, I could go outside almost all times of the year. And it was like, you could tell the difference in the mood, like being by the yeah. water. So the effects of like the splashing water and the positive and negative ions with that one. Oof, um, that. And then the difference from being inside where you're around this technology all the time. So then that's admitting more of those positive ions. So like constantly messing with your nervous system. Yeah. But, um, one of my patients, uh, interestingly, tying back into the aura ring, he's like, when I sleep at home and he, he does IT, um, or like computer software. He's like, when I sleep at home, I get in like the seventies every single time for my, my sleep. But he also does a lot of like backpacking. So he's like, mm -hmm. when I go and sleep outside, it's easily 97% or mm -hmm. higher every single time. Yeah. That's so nice. I think that we are, we are made to like interact with nature in a way that we just are missing out on. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I just putting, I tell patients all the time, like, Anyone that has like a laboratory marker of inflammation, so like high CRP or high SED rate or anything like that, or anyone that's experiencing stress, I always say like, if you can do two things for yourself, here are the two things you got to do. Go outside, put your bare feet in the grass 10 minutes a day, because grounding as it's called as a practice has been shown. They've done like thermography studies and found that inflammation before and after grounding is markedly decreased. But it's also, again, getting those positive ions, connecting with nature and doing something positive for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I say is end your shower on cold. End your oh. shower on cold. Do it. I tried mm -hmm. it. it. It just takes my breath away. It's, it's too uncomfortable. 
you know, uh, it's there's, those, there's beauty of being uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's it. That's it, Pat, because taking a shower, ending it on coal is like a phenomenal way to engender a resilient nervous system. It's a really good way to get one thing under your belt that you did for yourself that didn't have to do with your work, didn't have to do with your like relationships, didn't have to do with anything except for you and your body. So, and on top of it, it, you're doing something that's inherently very uncomfortable, right? But you have control. So you're kind of subconsciously showing your nervous system that you can adequately handle something that's very uncomfortable. So I see a lot of people doing cold exposure and then saying, you know, the everyday stressors that I experience a lot more tolerable. Mm. Yeah. There's a, a friend sent me a Ted talk about taking cold showers and just that attention of making yourself uncomfortable makes other mm -hmm. things in life a little bit easier. So having difficult conversations because it's like, you're, practicing that that all right I'm gonna put myself in this uncomfortable position and right that how that can spread through all different types of situations throughout your day true it's that's it's like it really is such a good way I love it and then you know hydrotherapy is something that I think is really interesting so like using water therapeutically so I mean like there's always the ice bath after a game right mm -hmm. but you can kind of manipulate water to kind of to either dilate or constrict your superficial blood vessels. And when that happens, you're shunting blood away from other places, right? So when you hit your skin with hot water, you're dilating kind of superficially, but you're constricting internally to be able to shunt it out there. On the other hand, when you hit yourself with cold, you're constricting on the outside, but you're dilating your viscera. So you're getting a lot of blood flow to your important organs. So it's a really good way to wake your gut up. So if people have like nausea or they just feel like generally queasy in the morning, a cold shower will kind of put some attention to the circulation of your gut and warm things up, kind of kickstart that process for you. Ah, okay. I did not know that at all. Mm. Hydrotherapy. Yeah. One of the best practices. So I was uh, reading, I think it was like <laughs> the brain and exercise and mm -hmm. it goes over a lot of BDNF. So I, I don't know if that helps a little bit more with it. Cause one of the ones they talk about is intermittent fasting. So mm -hmm. by you pretty much intentionally putting your body through stress and not giving it what it wants right away, it was like right. that old stress helps with that BDNF response. And that's totally true. Like you know, I think it, it's also, I mean, there are so many things I could say about intermittent fasting. It's interesting. There's a study that just came out that like debunked intermittent fasting, but it's, it's still, I mean, it talks about it for in the context of like weight loss, but that's not always the goal. Right. Mm -hmm. But again, like intermittent fasting is a nice kind of positive or you stress on the body, but then it also, um, we have something called a migrating motor complex in our gut, which is basically like our interdigestive housekeeper. That's the thing that between meals kind of churns your food and then moves it down the tube. So if you're like constantly snacking through the day, or if you don't go a long period of time without food, that interdigestive housekeeper is not happening. So like good, healthy bowel movements, good, healthy elimination requires like a nice cleanup inside. And so spacing out your meals, having a lot of time between dinner and breakfast is like a lot more critical than just benefiting weight loss. Shoot. I need to stop snacking. Uh, <laughs> this is making me rethink my entire, <laughs> my well, entire the, life. The caveat is too, like, I mean, if snacking is something that brings you joy and it's not like something you do in privacy or shame, then what's, uh, what's the need, right? Yeah. I do it out of boredom. It's like, I'm, oh, I'm there you go. Canceled, canceled on me. It was like. <laughs> Let me, let me eat some of the popcorn that's in the back. Or you can be like, why you feel the need to eat some popcorn in the back? You know, sit with yourself a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I, I should. That's knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just being intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing, uh, you mentioned bowel movements. Uh, that was a post. And uh, say so you can tell, do you have enough hydration in your body or 
the difference between what what's constipated looks like versus right. diarrhea versus like a normal stool. And I was like, wow. So now like trying to make this conscious effort to like look at my stool every time. I know. <laughs> it's like weird, but then I like just weird in the sense like I'm not used to doing it and I don't know if, but also it's like I coming back like does anyone else do this or am I the only one just like going oh, yeah. a deep dive into what I just put in this toilet yo like, yeah it's- not, not hands on deep dive but a, good, a good glimpse is all you need <laughs> I, was like, a deep dive. Right, I was like <laughs> honestly no because it's funny like I you know that that intake I do always is like How's your bowel movement? Does it sink? Does it float? What color is it? Where on like, we have the bristle stools, it's the bristle stool chart, which goes from like being tiny little solid pebbles to being like liquid. It's like, where are you today? Mm. How many times did you do it? Any blood, mucus, undigested foods, like all of these things that go into honestly, this major part of our physiology, like really one of the most energy expensive processes aside from like thinking and moving even though moving is required in digestion is uh i know it's a little like fun kind of hurdle you have to cross with certain people it's just being like you need to look at it please yeah so so now every time i hear was it a floater or a sinker i'm gonna think right. like <laughs> scientifically <laughs> yeah. right <laughs> so what what is uh what what's normal or what's what's a good way of like okay so not pebbles and not not a, right a submarine um, but like a nice good sausage is what they say in the business Gross. like nice easy like really shouldn't be shouldn't hurt shouldn't take too long shouldn't be an excessive wipe as they say like you really need shouldn't need to wipe too many times um, that's like a good healthy bowel movement. Mm, invest in the the squatty potty. Yes, sir. Yeah, you want to relax, relax mm. the pelvic floor. Mm. That's something I've been super interested in recently is the pelvic floor. I'm sure you guys know like so much about it, but I'm just as like a consumer of information. I'm like, we don't talk about this enough. Oh no, we actually we had someone on uh like two weeks, two, three weeks ago that talked about it. It's a lot of a lot of information that I feel like the common person doesn't know about their own, even their own body, obviously, but like even right. the pelvic floor specifically and how huge that is for um, one of the things that, that we talked about was weight, like a weightlifter who had, uh, what is it called? Leakage, mm-hmm. leakage. And even still like for us, our, our natural instinct is to be like, oh, so you have fluid coming out of you. Maybe it's not strong enough. Right. Like we try to say, okay, let's, let's do Kegel. Let's do something. But then also we have to look at it in the same way that we look at other muscles and say, okay, is it too tight? And that's why it's not working. So maybe you don't need Kegels and maybe instead you need to learn how to relax it. So even something like the squatty potty, it was like, okay, can you even take the time during your bowel movements to relax it? Yeah. That's and also just when it comes to pelvic floor, uh, there's a lot of shame and a lot of just like, uneasiness that comes with like talking about this information but i feel like if we get this information out there yeah. a lot of people feel better about themselves and like yeah and know how know when they should see a professional if something's totally i'm all about that i think like if you are a provider you, like if you present everything as unbiased safe space like i care because it's going to be helpful like doors open for people who previously were feeling shameful of certain things. So like pelvic floor health, bowel movements, eating behaviors, like all of these things have like a little bit of taboo behind them, but like to just be able to sit down and relate to someone and be like, no, I'm, I'm only interested because it's helpful. You brought up a good point. I think in your other podcast was like, if you're going to eat at the, the fridge, pull up a chair, Oh yeah. One of my favorite. Can you go into that? (laughs) That a little bit more. So one of my favorite authors to recommend for people who struggle with eating behaviors is a woman named Janine Roth. Um, She is marvelous. She's like a really sensational writer, effective communicator, but she wrote this book called, if you're going to eat at the refrigerator, pull up a chair. And um, it's basically all about the fact that we do so much we, we hold so much shame to food in private, you know, and her whole thing is 
the food you have on your plate is a reflection of your relationship with yourself. Is it abundant? Is it vibrant? Is it cooked with love or is it shameful? Is it hidden? Is it kept away from others? Um, and I had a mentor who said, you know, if you're going to make a mistake, make a big mistake, which is like, own it, live up to it. Don't do anything in private, take full accountability for what you do and start to hold space for yourself. Because I think so many people, when it comes to food and it comes to eating, you know, we're working as clinicians with people who were raised in a generation of like seeing at the grocery store, like Tyra Banks getting slammed for wearing a bikini. And it's like, Tyra Banks has a beautiful body. What is that about? Yeah. Um, and so we have to help people radically unlearn that. And it's not just a mindset thing. It's also behavioral because people have been spending their lifetimes sometimes not eating anything when they go out to dinner with friends and then going home and binging. And that is profoundly uncomfortable for people to get into. But again, it's one of those things. It's like, we just got to normalize and validate things and be like, listen, this is just as much a product of our culture as it is anything else. So we got to own it and we got to really like work on it and love ourselves hard. 100%. Pat, have, what, what was the book? Was it Atomic Habits or one of them that talks about like, like how you said, make a mistake. If you're going to make it, make it big. But it talks about in terms of mindset, and this could relate to anything in your lifetime or healthcare related. Like if you do something, say you had, say you had a cheesecake uh, after dinner, or you had that for breakfast per se, and you were trying to be on a diet, it was like, okay, don't let that ruin the rest of your thing. Yes. A lot of people will be like, I started off bad. Let me just say F this day. And then continue to eat bad yeah, yeah it was yeah it was the author of uh atomic habits mm -hmm. he was on a podcast um the drive i believe with peter atia mm -hmm. uh, and he was thinking he splits his day into quarters and so it's like if you make a mistake in the morning it's like so you had a cheesecake for breakfast and it's like sure like that's the first quarter of the day is like the just don't have two bad quarters or something like and something to that effect of one quarter as for a football game or for sports fans like one quarter does not change the or affect the entirety of your day it's like i love that be okay to was like all right sure Lost we did quarter but we didn't have a good quarter let's make a good next one and it's just like so throughout the day you and then you can also reflect i was like all right had a pretty good uh, if, you, if your day is like a game it's like oh, i had a pretty good game pretty good day like three of the four quarters of the day i was on top of it and so I was thinking about it that way i love then, that yeah and then also to the next day i was like well we didn't have a good day yesterday let's make a better day today we have four quarters to do that let's just just trying to reshape reframe yeah reframing is key i think like that piece of cheesecake in the morning really shouldn't ruin the day, but for so many people, it's like game over. Yeah. And, you know, it's tough. I feel like it kind of harkens on this concept of something called all or nothing thinking, which I think as like our culture kind of trains us to do, which is like cheesecake, game over, done. It can't be like cheesecake, delicious, fun might upset my stomach because I don't like dairy, but like, you know, <laughs> on the next, you know, it's just never mm. all or nothing thinking is really, we kind of sentence ourselves to the outcomes of our behaviors instead of just being like neutrally accepting of them. Yeah. I yeah. like that. Yeah. Cause I think he was going along that all or nothing. Cause most people, oh, I messed up my diet for the day. Let me just go ahead and uh, binge and just eat right. whatever I want today. It was, it was like, all right, let's reframe and let's break it up into quarters and do it that way. Yeah. Like there's nothing wrong with you. And I think yeah. a, lot of people, a lot of people just don't hear that enough. Mm. And like, again, a lot of these things, a lot of these like shameful thoughts occur in private. So I like one of my favorite things to do as a clinician is to like destigmatize, normalize and validate stuff so we can actually be productive. Mm -hmm. And like, 
nobody walks out of an appointment with me with any shame. That's a, like a rule. Right. Yeah, be kind to yourself. Like say, yeah. like don't like we're always so tough on ourselves because we have this image of what we're supposed to do. It's like you don't have to be anything than other than what you are. Right. Yeah. yeah like. Hmm? I was just saying, hundred percent. I think like one of the students that I studied under when I was just starting out in clinic would always say that you are as healthy as your thoughts. And I'm like, every day I think about that and I'm like, it's so true. Like, are you nice to yourself in there? Cause the world doesn't know, like no one else will know only you. Yeah. Interestingly enough, someone told me one time they were like with your thoughts, it was like, would you speak to, to someone else the same way you speak to yourself? And it was like, probably not. And then you realize like, oh, damn, I'm really talking to myself like crazy. So when it comes down to those things of like all or nothing, it was like, I feel like that puts forth so many bad thoughts into like your own head to now we amplify that out into the world. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. So you, ooh, like you, you ate that cheesecake. You're supposed to be on a diet. Like you sure you're really supposed to do that? I know it was like a yeah. lot of the shaming type of stuff or like the Tyra Banks thing you saw, like she's wearing a bikini. Like, ooh, should she really be wearing that? Like who said yeah. You know, also like I, I fundamentally like vehemently reject this concept of like diet begins tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like had my cheesecake diet begins tomorrow because <laughs> like diets are, I don't know. There's a lot that I attach to diets. And I think my, like the way that I grew up around like diet culture and things like that, like the way that I view diets outside of being a clinician is just being like a human being is like diets always seem super temporary where it's like, I'll stop that once I'm like, whatever my goal weight is. Yep. And it's like, whoa, that's again, it's like another thing that we're doing just for the sake of weight loss. Like we're not caring about your insides. We're not caring about how you feel. We're just doing something because you're prioritizing your shape over your state. Yeah. hundred percent. And then it's, going deeper is like, why do you even want to be that weight? What does that weight signify? Is what does that it, mean? Yeah. yeah. So I will mean, you value yourself then? And why not now? Yeah. And that, that spills over into like a huge thing just with this society that um, we look for the quick fix or we look for like the best because we've seen a, an image of something. Whereas now when we get like, especially for, for us, it's like people just want that injection because, okay, now it, it once I get this injection, I'll have uh, no more pain. And then for me, I can live happily, but it's like, but you need to get at the root cause of it is like, why do you have that pain? Like pain again is very subjective. And I can't really say like, yes, because you have pain, this is, this is the, the right thing for you to do. Right. But it's the same thing when it comes to the eating is like, yes, you want to do that diet, but you just restricted all those things. And like, now going into that, like the gut health and all that stuff. So you just took out a huge portion of, of food that you might have. And it's like, okay, so now yeah. that, that can be a little bit more detrimental. And you're probably going to stop it once you get to whatever goal weight. All right. Yeah. yeah. Cutting out food that you enjoy. Mm. <laughs> that makes you happy. That changes like the way you view things. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I, I just like, you know, there is, there are a couple of things I always think about when it comes to really restrictive diets, which is like one when you restrict, there will always be the potential for metabolic adaptation. So your body will get used to having fewer calories and will readjust its set point so that your energy expenditure and your energy requirements are at that level. So the second you reintroduce food at a slightly higher caloric level, your body is going to jump on it and you'll constantly yo-yo. Like people fall into this this really kind of unfortunate dance of always yo-yo dieting where they restrict and then they eat normally and then it just, they've metabolically adapted. So their weight just goes back up. That's kind of why, especially in like the fitness spheres and especially in like the, um, especially in like female fitness spheres, like reverse dieting has really taken hold because it's a really good way to readjust your set point mindfully. Because once your diet or your cutting phase is over, instead of just going back to willy nilly eating all the things you cut out for that period of time, you're still being intentional, but you're intaking more calories. So you're manipulating your body's energy requirements in a way that is 
you're still in control and you still have full authority. Yeah, that's that's really huge, especially with like the cutting stuff. I, I always thought it was interesting because I when I played volleyball, we shared the the locker room with the wrestling team. And thinking of when they'd be going on their cutting phase where they can't be or they had to weigh in. I'm like, how are you supposed to be able to cut out all these things and then perform at like your optimal le level at a weight that you're not even living at? So it was like, I didn't know what that deal is like. That has to be doing something to, to yeah. your body also. It's like an extreme stressor. I always remember the wrestlers in high school would like layer up with all those like thermal jackets and things like that. And then go <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's um, again, it just like harkens back to this point of sustainability, which is like, you're still thinking about your, I mean, granted, this is weight loss. This isn't like total body health, but you're still thinking about your health and your weight loss in terms of a set point and not a lifestyle not a lifespan like diet begins tomorrow and diet ends when you've lost weight like diet ends when you're at wrestling weight and it's the body doesn't the body still exists like you're not nothing changes except for your plans when you do something like that yeah also what's um i feel like a lot of people have uh are lactose intolerant mm-hmm and for me, I'm like, it's a, it's an alarming amount to the point. I'm like, are we even supposed to be having that much dairy or stuff like that? Is there, or is that more of like, just because of their genes? And I know it's probably very variable. Yeah. Lactose intolerance, like textbook lactose intolerance is, you know, people experience pretty profusive or at least discomforting diarrhea after ingestion of lactose. Um, it's because you don't have one of the intestinal brush border enzymes, which is beta galactosidase or uh, lactase. So you're not physically capable of splitting up the lactose molecule that you ingest. And um, therefore lactose literally becomes like a laxative to you. It stays in the gut undigested and that osmotic gradient occurs and it draws water into the gut. And then you're diarying so um it definitely is very prevalent in americans <laughs> yeah, i'm like is this thing toxic like why <laughs> like, have problems. and then it's interesting it's it's not so common or it's not so common and i think like nordic populations um it is genetic um and i don't know it's it's interesting like I, and a lot of people who are textbook lactose intolerance, you know, they'll take a lactate pill, you know, those, which is literally that lactase enzyme. And then they'll be good to go when they ever have that piece of cheesecake in the morning. And, <laughs> but then there's definitely, I mean, like certain people just don't do well with dairy products. It can be rather congesting. So if people find that they get like a lot of nasal congestion, if they're clearing their throat a lot, um, ultra pasteurized milk, again, like we talked about, can have high levels of that bug colincella. So I, if you have leaky gut or the signs of leaky gut, that's probably a good thing to not ingest more of. Um, yeah, but then it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, it definitely is a lot more common than we think. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people that don't even recognize that they have it. They just are like, my bowels are yeah. <laughs> I've always had a sensitive stomach. That's a, <laughs> some royal rumble happening in there, you know, you know what I mean? I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, crazy enough, because we, like, I feel like my my family members, like the older ones, always talk about those things like, oh, when you get to be 30, wait until you see how your digestion is. And for me, I'm like, I don't know if it's that you guys are never in the healthcare field, so you never really took the time to research and say, okay, why did it happen around the age of 30? my personal opinion is probably that their, their tissue resistance has been getting stressed for so long on things like improper breathing, sleeping, not eating well, not moving well. So like, for me, that's kind of what I thought of, but I don't know, maybe it might be the fact that uh, something about it in terms of my gut health. Yeah. Playing a role. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people do think that like getting older inherently means that like everything needs to go downhill. And while that is somewhat a natural product of life, like there are certain things that I think we're just starting to realize don't have to go with age. Like 
you shouldn't just have diarrhea when you turn 40. Like something happened and it wasn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what was that shift? What was that change? Yeah, like it, it, cause I mean, again, your body doesn't really, you have like a circadian rhythm, of course, but your body's not like happy 40th birthday body. Like Here's diarrhea. diarrhea. <laughs> But here, wake up with some back yeah. pain. Look, you're 40 now. Your knees are gonna hurt. Yeah. Here you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that was that that's one of the things that I struggle with explaining to people too. Is like there's been years and years of you doing things improperly, like kind of how you said before, like I want to feel how I felt 10 years ago. It's like, yeah, but probably from 10 years until now, you've slowly been been not damaging your body, but not giving it the love that it needs. Right. Uh, the fact that it's like, oh, I'm 40 and oh shit. Now all of a sudden these things hurt. I wake up, my stomach is bloated every time I eat anything. So I think that's exactly. just another thing for people to even understand, like getting old doesn't mean that things are going to start to break down. It's just, you can't recover as easily. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's, it's totally, it totally brings back that point that we talked about, which is like, your health isn't a destination. It's a process all the time. So like, while you totally can lift for hypertrophy and hypertrophy only, like you're also getting the benefits of those weight bearing exercises on your bone health. Mm. So like, that's an investment that is for your lifetime. Like that's super beneficial for you. And I think again, like that's a mindset shift that I think a lot of people are just slowly opening up to, which is like, if you actually just remove the concept of aesthetics entirely from your health plan, things just get better. They just improve uh, tenfold. Yeah. Cause even still everything shifts. It's like, okay, cool. You wanted to be the big dude before, but now all of a sudden it's in to be more lean or things like right. that. So it was like, there's no point in having that aesthetic purpose. It's like, you're just going to stress yourself out. Yeah. yeah. In this view that's not beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Right. And like you were in your body today, you don't have to love your body. Like in this idea that you have of it in say two months, like that's super common. They're like, Oh, when I do this, like then, then I'll start loving myself. And it's like, dude, just start now. It's, yep, it's not right easy, now. but like start saying that stuff to yourself. It's helpful. Yeah. And we had somebody on that talked a lot about, uh, like the being present in the moment and just being knowing yourself as perfection because it means that you're without lack and that that's huge for us in terms of of progress so it's like everyone sees like i know where you're coming in from you're coming in with elbow pain and i was like i know you want to get to to playing golf without any pain at all so it was like for us being sure like okay can you love how your body is now and saying okay although my elbow does hurt i can still do all these other things and then with that positive thinking you now change your entire plan of care instead of saying, all right, did I wake up with elbow pain when I go to do this or my favorite activity? Yeah. It's that all or nothing thinking that I think oh. really like sentences people to their thoughts. Mm -hmm. They're just thoughts. Right. All they are. You know, you have behaviors and feelings too. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Emily, for, for joining us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nice. Thank this you conversation. for conversation. Right. <laughs> uh, what, what's your, um, where can people find you if, if, if they have any questions or want to reach out? Sure. To you? So I'm on Instagram, doctor. So dr. Emily Um, super responsive there. That's kind of like my main channel. I'm going to be opening a practice in Norwalk in the fall upon licensure. So I'll do both, um, local on the ground medicine, whether you want genomics and microbiome stuff. And then on top of that, I'll also have a telehealth platform for my non-local friends. So Southwestern Connecticut, I got you, but. What about Southwest California? You I got you got too. There we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we got to talk about some gut health. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Guys, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure.